Welcome to Ring of Fire, I'm Farron Cousins sitting in for Mike Papantonio. Today on Ring of Fire, we'll find out why secularism cannot survive in America if liberalism is destroyed. We'll also tell you why the FBI is keeping a close eye on anti-government extremists from the far right, and the GOP is having trouble courting female voters, and they still don't know why. We'll help them figure that out with author Nancy Cohen. We have all that and more coming up, but right now, you've stepped into the Ring of Fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> Tensions in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq and Syria, have reached dangerous levels in recent months. The insurgent ISIS has laid claim to parts of Iraq that were already torn apart by the United States aggression in the country for the last decade. We left the country in ruins with a barely functioning government, and it's hard to say that the current crisis is not a result of our actions. But still, the Iraq war that Bush started only proves that an assault followed by an occupation is not a sustainable foreign policy, and it has only harmed all of the parties involved. We were warned from the start by military analysts, foreign policy experts, and a few brave politicians that invading Iraq would only serve to embolden terrorist organizations in the area and that they would actually use the occupation as a recruiting tool. And they were all correct. Those warnings that were ignored have all played themselves out in the Middle East over the last decade, and we're now seeing the results. The other warning we were given was that torturing detainees would also embolden terrorist groups. And again, those dire predictions were spot on. We made this current mess, and we have no idea how to solve it. But some politicians refuse to accept the fact that our foreign policy was a failure, and they're pushing for yet another war in the Middle East. Senators like John McCain and Lindsey Graham have been making their rounds in the media, trying to convince the public that another war is both necessary and unavoidable. Republicans are not the only ones beating the drums of war, though. Democratic establishment favorite Hillary Clinton has also let her hawkish side show, and she's also pushing for aggressive military action in the region. These war hawks are conveniently ignoring the fact that the invasion of Iraq was a huge mistake. The American lives that were lost cannot be regained or even avenged by sending more troops to die in the Middle East. Bad policy from a decade ago cannot be forgiven by pushing for another war. McCain, Graham, and Clinton know they messed up back then, and they want redemption. Unfortunately, the only way they see that happening is to make the same mistakes that they made in 2003. They simply don't get it. In the run-up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq, media outlets were buzzing about how necessary this war was, and they hosted every Bush-era war hawk that had a few minutes to tell their skewed version of what was happening in Iraq. Yellow cake, aluminum tubes, weapons of mass destruction. I'm sure we all remember those talking points that turned out to be completely false. But the media allowed them to sell this war because for them, war is good business. Ratings increased, ad sales went up, and media outlets became fat and happy by selling Bush's war. There wasn't a vast system of independent online news outlets or even social media outlets to get the truth to the public like we have now. What the mainstream media sold back then the American public bought. Luckily, we do have that independent media system in place today to help counter those war hawks. And perhaps that's the only reason why we aren't currently marching troops into Iraq. The bottom line is that this country is a mess. Yes, we made a mess in Iraq, but if we want to get serious about fixing that, we need to work with other nations through the UN to get that done. In the meantime, we need to address the very serious problems that we have on our own soil. One of those problems is the looming foreclosure crisis. The federal government has offered up a lot of different solutions to help big banks, but so far, few if any of those plans have been designed to help underwater homeowners. And with another foreclosure crisis right around the corner, it's time to get homeowners some relief. Joining me now to talk about what's being done to help struggling homeowners is Michael Berg. Michael, a lot of the plans that have come out of the government to, you know, try to solve pretty much any of the financial crises that have hit the United States in the last four or five, six years have all been geared towards helping the banks. You know, the whole quantitative easing was, you know, 
meant to help home, homeowners, but what it did basically was give the banks yet another bailout. Can I explain that a little bit for us. Well, what really happened, Farron, and I think most of our, our, our watchers and viewers know, is that you know what happened was they gave the money. They gave billions and billions and billions of dollars to the banks, and they thought that was going to help remedy some of the problems. They also were trying to get the banks to readjust many of the mortgages. As we know, the crisis that hit in to, late 2007, 2008, we had incredible amount of foreclosures. What the hope was at one point in time was that the banks would readjust those and, and would, would actually renegotiate those loans, which they did not do. No, they, and, they, and, they, they didn't because they put no real controls in place. They didn't, they didn't make them do it. They said, here, here is all this, you know, basically fictional money because it was only money created on computers. And they said, this is what we'd like you to do with it. So please go do that. But we're not going to check back up on you. Right. And I have an insider uh, who actually was on the Fed committee. I won't mention that person's name, but uh, they, they were really pushing hard for the government to come in. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, the things the government could have done and they still can do now. But at the time, this individual was pushing very hard to have a bailout of the actual homeowners where the government would take over the bank loans and, and would do that by basically just telling them, we're going to lend you the money, you're going to give us those loans, and we're going to renegotiate them, and we're going to take the interest rates down so we don't have foreclosures because we know people are underwater with regard to their equity in the house. When you owe more than, than the house is worth, people are going to let those houses go. If, however, you take their payments low enough and they're able to make the payment, and the, the house be, begins to increase in value, which we've seen over the last few years, then, then you're going to be able to keep the economy moving and you're not going to have all these things we've seen, including banks improperly going after uh, and getting foreclosures on homes they really don't even have an interest in. We'll talk a little bit about that, the MERS, in which, in which basically it's all computer data now in which is being relied upon. And, and quite frankly, it's, it's inadequate. We've talked about the Wells Fargo and some of the other fraudulent uh, uh, it, uh, action taken by banks in regard to that. But the truth is, we still need a plan now to make sure we don't have a reoccurrence of what happened in 08. And right now, there currently is not a plan. I mean, we've got 40% of mortgages that are underwater. There's only, I think, about 29% of homes in the United States that have no mortgage on them that are paid off free and clear. And that is a record low. So obviously, something has to be done because uh, during this quantitative easing, during you know, right after the last housing market crash, up comes another bubble. And that's what we're in right now. We do have this bubble. Home prices are starting to come back a little bit, but that's not, that's not helping anyone other than, than banks or, or people, you know, who have the money to sit on a home and just watch the value go up. So what exactly could be done? I know you mentioned about the uh, federal government buying up these mortgages from the banks and renegotiating. But what else, what are some of the other solutions that are kind of floating around out there at the moment? Well, you know, uh, Senator Merkley, uh, he had an idea. And, and let me also say one of the other problems we have is that second mortgages are resetting over the next two, three years. So we got to worry about that also, because if they reset and, and those interest rates go up, then we're going to have more defaults. We're going to have more problems than even we know about now. There's three alternatives that we have here, and, and there may be more. And I think the first one is d during the, you know, 1933, we, uh, the government went into what was known as the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And what happened there is similar to what this individual I knew at the Fed wanted to do, which is basically they were going to come in and they were going to buy the mortgages. And they still can do that now. We could do that and sell bonds to pay for it, or they could use the, 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 the uh, QE that they're printing the money and use that to buy it. But either one of those things would work. I think the uh, homeowner's loan corporation would be better because then you'd get investors who would actually invest in it. They'd get a 2 to 3 or 4% return. And then those loans then would no longer have the problem that we have with the banks. It would allow the government or, the, or, or HOLC to renegotiate those loans. So, so that's something they could do. 
Uh, had they done it in, in 08, it, it was interesting talking to this gentleman at the Fed. He said we would have avoided, you know, 70 percent of the problems we had because the relief would have gone directly to the consumers. So that's one one alternative. Well, that um, <laughs> the, the only problem I see with that is that it obviously it was an FDR New Deal type proposal. And anything that we have uh, or, or I can't say we the Democrats in Washington have tried to push through that is reminiscent of the New Deal, they're firmly against. In fact, they've already tried to repeal a lot of the uh, uh, important things from the New Deal. But I, I, I'm scared that that's what it's going to take. It's going to take another just national nightmare like we had when FDR came into office for people to finally step back and say, OK, all right, do what you have to do to fix the problem. <laughs> Here's the problem. The problem goes all the way back to Citizens United. It goes back to money and politics. It goes back to the money. If you want to find out where the problem is, follow the money. The Republicans and even some Democrats at this point in time, their job is to get reelected. And getting elected means money. And the money's coming from the giant corporations. It's coming from the Koch brothers. It's coming from, you know, it's, it's unlimited money, billions and billions of dollars. And the problem we have here is those corporations, the Koch brothers, uh, the giant pharma companies, the big banks, they don't care about the consumers. They don't care about the people losing their houses because they think somehow that's going to benefit them. But it's not putting productivity back into the middle class. It's not allowing people to own homes. They have no conscience, none, zero, when it comes to the average American who right now is struggling and potentially is on the edge, that those 70 percent of those loans you talked about, 40 percent of them are underwater, they're on the edge, and the Republicans and, and, and unfortunately some blue dog Democrats don't care, and it's time we get rid of them. Absolutely. Now's the time. And, and, Vote and, them out. And, and another important point is the fact that you know we, we have this, we're one quarter away of negative growth, to be back into a recession right now. But at the same time, corporate profits are at a record high. So we're having massive profits for corporations, for, for, for Big Pharma, for Wall Street, for everybody over there, but the middle class, the, 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 the bottom class, they're losing so much money. And this mortgage problem is, is really the tip of a much, much bigger iceberg. Because once, you know, if the government doesn't act, if the banks refuse to act, these people lose their homes, and it is a slippery slope from that point because they will start to lose so much more after that. And, and there's no apartments. The apartment prices right now, because of what we went through, apartments and the cost of apartments are going up, up, up. All the people who own these apartments, the very wealthy, they're raising the rents. These people lose their homes. They're not, there's nowhere for them to go. They're going to be homeless. We're going to have a bigger homeless problem than we have right now. One of the other alternatives, of course, is eminent domain. The government can go in and just take those loans. The government can go in and say, we're going to, we're going to take those loans and we're going to reset them. But without Congress, without a president who's willing to do that, to make the tough choices, to help the middle class, to support the poor or the near poor, uh, you really need to make a change in November. This is where... Really, the people watching this, tell all your friends, you got to get rid of these people who only care about the, the, the very rich, the wealthy, the billionaires, the, the multi, multi millionaires, because they're running the government right now. And as long as they run the government, no one's going to give relief like we've talked about here. That's that's a potential. You're absolutely right, Michael. And thank you so much for being with us. I'm sure you and I could talk about this for another 30 minutes, but uh, maybe <laughs> maybe so at much. least an hour. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Farron. I appreciate it. All right. You might not think that liberalism and secularism have anything in common, but they're actually more connected than you might think. Joining me now to explain the link between the two is C.J. Worleman, author of the book Crucifying America. C.J., your recent article on how the decline of liberalism uh, threatens secularism in America, the title alone really caught my attention. It's, it's such a unique uh, uh, idea and unique concept here. Uh, can you explain a little bit to us about, uh, you know, uh, how you came up with that? What's the connection between liberalism and secularism? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Aaron. I, um, I, I haven't seen anybody else make that connection. I'm not trying to give myself a, a pat on the back here, but uh, 
uh, you know, the atheist movement, the secular movement, whether it's a secular, secular coalition or, or other, hasn't really addressed how to defeat what is probably the greatest enemy to secularism in this country, and that's the Christian right. Um, now, but if you look abroad, you only have to look at it from a historical perspective and see how far we've come and how far we've moved the needle towards uh, uh, becoming a, a quasi theocratic uh, nation with a very hyper religious base to the Republican Party. And that's if you look in the period, you know, at any stage in America's history in the 20th century up until the, age, the, the point of 1980. It was as rare for a politician in those times to declare himself a born again Christian as it is rare for a politician to today to declare himself an atheist. Simply in the era of FDR liberalism, where we met the economic needs of the American people through social and economic reforms, the Christian right was not an active player or an influential player in, uh, in US politics. Today, after coming through, you know, from uh, Reagan ushered in um, an end to uh, FDR, they were basically repealed, began the repeal of uh, the New Deal. And after three decades of unfettered capitalism, deregulate, deregulation, privatization, we've totally abandoned the working class. And the point I try to make in the piece is that, that liberalism died with Reagan in 1980 and then Clinton buried its body. Uh, when he came into power in 1991, uh, sorry, in, in, in uh, 1993. Um, now, Clinton embraced, after having 12 years effectively of Reaganomics, where we have the, the two terms of Reagan, we had the one term of Bush 41, uh, Clinton's presidency was an opportunity to offer a countervailing power to what had been unfettered capitalism at the expense of the working class and the middle class. But instead, he embraced the sanctity of the free market. And when you take economic issues off the table, as, as has been since 1980, uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats, well, the working class and middle class are left with no economic voice. And when you do that, all that's left is the social issues, God, guns and gays. Right. And, and well, well, you know, when, when, when Bush, uh, W. Bush came into office, obviously the religious right experienced this huge resurgence. They had been relatively, I guess, kind of quiet during the Clinton years. Bush came into office. Suddenly they had, you know, their guy. He had no qualms about, you know, making his agenda public. It was all about the Christian right. You know, we had Ralph Reed. We had that whole crew come in. But then uh, around 2006, 2007, and certainly leading into 2008, all the headlines uh, in a lot of liberal publications were saying, the religious right is dead. The Christian right is gone. They have lost their power, but they didn't lose their power. They just kind of sank away from the spotlight. They're still doing pretty much everything they've been doing for, for decades now. They're just doing it a little bit more quietly. And I think a great example of that is Sam Brownback in Kansas, you know, a, a very, very hardcore Christian. And, and he is pretty much to uh, help to destroy the state of Kansas at this point, hasn't he? Correct, and and you, you're right to say that the Christian right certainly wasn't an influential factor in the 08 and, and 2012 election. Uh, from that point, the Christian right started moving away from focusing its en efforts and energies at the presidential electoral level, uh, level as really focused on taking state house after state house and enacting their agenda, um, well, basically turning states into um, theocratic uh, laboratories. And Kansas is a perfect example of that. Uh, they elected one of the most radical Christian governors in the in the country, and he's totally gutted that state. Instead of getting a, a, you know any effort to repeal Roe, Roe v. Wade at the federal level, any effort to uh, um, to enact any part of the agenda, all they've got is a stripping away of social safety nets and public education and so forth. And that's typical of what we're seeing in these red states. Well, and it seems like a lot of times these politicians who come out and they claim to be, you know, such strong Christians with these great moral values, all they're really doing, in, in, in my opinion, perhaps I'm wrong, is they're just preying on the naivety of their voting base. I mean, these people think like, wow, yes, this is a great Christian guy and, and, and we're going to follow the principles of Christ. But that's not what's happened anywhere. These are just corporate shills 
who've underst- uh, understand how to play the system. They know how to play the voters. They know what words work. They know if I go out there and say abortion is bad, that this little group of people is going to say, I'll vote for you no matter what you do now. And is that kind of how they do it? Well, it, it, that's exactly right. They're the unwitching pawns for uh, corporate overlords. <laughs> I mean, if, uh, if the Christian right or, or the predominantly evangelical base in this country actually followed the social gospel of the New Testament, we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> I mean, Jesus advocated when Jesus gave away free health care. It wasn't like he asked the leper for a copay. And, um, you know, uh, you, Jesus wasn't a union-busting, hardline conservative that wanted to put military bases in every corner of the world. He was a Marxist before Marxism had a name. Yeah. Well, you know, it, 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 it's very sad that we still have this entire group of people out there in America who will go out there every day, beat on the book and say, look, this country was founded on Christian principles by Christian men who wanted a Christian country, and they still, they just don't seem to get it. I mean, none of that could be further from the truth, but they're still going to stay out there and they're going to support anybody who comes out there and says that I'm an evangelical Christian and I, I feel your pain, as Clinton would say. Well, exactly. And, and, and by putting social issues for, for, uh, at the forefront, they're voted for their own economic destruction. Uh, it benefits in no way the, the, the working class and the middle class to have manufacturing jobs outsourced overseas. It benefits no way the Christian right, which is predominantly middle class, uh, to have uh, jobs outsourced, to have the privatization of social security, to have healthcare stripped away, to have um, access to Medicaid made that much tougher. So, uh, but you know, when, when, you know, coming back to my original point, liberalism is dead in this country. The working class and the middle class do not have a liberal uh, voice that will represent them in Washington anymore. The Democrats have completely sold out liberalism. Uh, if we had liberalism in this country, we would have ended up with universal health care instead of you know, a free market solution, which is basically a Republican plan. So by not meeting the economic needs and the will of the people like countries uh, like Australia, Canada and Western Europe do, it's no coincidence that the equivalent of the Christian right has no play in Western Europe, Canada, Scandinavia, or Australia, is because the economic needs of those people are being met. Liberal, they have healthy, thriving, liberal democracies. We don't. We have a, a, a country which praises economic uh, capitalism at all cost of everything, and that moves the working class towards far-right ideologies wrapped up in religion. And they all worship at the altar of big business. C.J. Whirlman, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate all your work, and uh, thanks again. Mate, thank you. Thanks for having me on. That's great. C.J. Whirlman is the author of the book, Crucifying America. If you spend any time listening to the right-wing hate talkers, you might think that the biggest threat to American citizens would be the illegal immigrants or the protesters in Ferguson, Missouri. But according to the FBI, the biggest threat to Americans actually comes from the right in the form of the sovereign citizens movement. Joining me now to talk about this is Howard Nations. Howard, it used to be that when you turn on Fox News, they would tell us that, oh gosh, everybody that that practices Islam is going to come over to America and kill us. Then recently they're saying, oh my God, look what's happening in Ferguson, Missouri. These, These people are a huge threat to American society. These protesters, these looters, we're all gonna die. I mean, they, they didn't go that far. But that's basically what they want us to think. They want us to think that it's either Muslims or, or minorities who are the biggest threat to American security. But a new study shows that that's not quite the case, is it? Absolutely. There's a new START study, which is the National Consortium for Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism. It's based on a survey of 364 officers from 175 different state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies, and they find that sovereign citizens is now the top concern of these agencies. The study showed, for example, that 52% of these people agreed and 34% strongly agreed that sovereign citizen is a serious, uh, serious terrorist threat. Compared to the Islamic extremists, 39% agreed and 28% strongly agreed uh, that they are a serious threat. So it comes out that 86% 
say sovereign citizens is the worst, 67% uh, Islamist. So that, that's a very important finding, and it's a big change from, from recent years. Absolutely. And so tell us a little bit about, you know, who are these sovereign citizens? You know, what do, what do they want? What do they do? What's, what's happening with them? <laughs> well, if you go to their website, the Sovereign Citizens is an organization that claims to have 300,000 members. The idea is that they renounce their U.S. citizenship. They don't acknowledge the existence of a federal government. They refuse to recognize it. And their idea is that you as an individual are a sovereign American state citizen. That you, you make your own rules yourself. You are a self-governing private state by yourself. Uh, if you look at their Sovereign Citizens Handbook, it says the title is Title IV Flag Says Your Swag. That's really the title of their of the citizen, uh, Sovereign Citizens Handbook. But to give you an idea, uh, Cliven Bundy, our world famous hero of the right, Cliven Bundy, fine example. He refused to pay money to the federal government for grazing rights, over a million dollars, uh, to the Department of Land Management. He didn't recognize the federal government, said, I don't owe you any money because you don't exist. So he became a rallying point for all the right-wing nuts to show up on his property in appropriately named Bunkerville, Nevada. And uh, the Soviet citizens were prominently on display there. They were aiming rifles at the FBI, which is in and of itself a federal felony. There was one point at which the local law enforcement, the sheriff's department, said they had to get between the the Soviet citizen, uh, the Soviet sovereign citizens, and the and the uh, land management people to protect the land management, the federal authority there. Uh, and unfortunately, the U.S. government, maybe wisely to avoid another Waco, the U.S. government backed down. Uh, and immediately after that, Bundy, who was so uh, grateful to the sovereign citizens joined their group. Uh, shortly after that, two sovereign citizen members executed two police officers in Nevada who were sitting in a restaurant having breakfast. They walked up behind them, shot them in the back of the head. They died later that day uh, in a shootout with, with the SWAT team. And I, I think what's important to say about these sovereign citizens as well is that, you know, it's not necessarily a hate group. It's not necessarily a branch of right-wing ideology, but their politics and their beliefs are firmly right-wing. And part of this is the result of decades of assault on federal government coming from the right. I mean, when they get on, when they get on TV, when they go on the radio, when they write their books and, and their think tanks come out with these, everything is government is bad, don't trust the government. And... Anytime you make such extreme statements, you will have part of the population who takes it so sincerely, takes that so deep that they begin to act out. And, and, and these instances like this, they're not all that rare. Uh, I, I know, you know you're good friends with Morris Dees at the Southern Poverty Law right. Center. And the Southern Poverty Law Center has done a phenomenal job of tracking these people because, again, they're not necessarily a hate group. But they are violent extremists. And I, I think that's what the START study is, is trying to show us that, you know, we, we're always looking for an enemy, whether it's the immigrants coming over the border, protesters in Ferguson, Islamists, you know, in the Middle East. But we don't have to look much further than our own backyard, do we? That's absolutely true. And one thing to point out about this group is they are not politically aligned with, with any a uh, right-wing Republican group like a lot of the right-wingers are. Uh, the only person's name I've ever seen come up in the discussion of, of sovereign citizens has been Ron Paul, which is the anti-federal government. The government shouldn't be in anything. And he's the only uh, politician I've ever seen them mention. Uh, but it's, it's been very interesting that where how they have increased in recent years uh, is that in the 2006 study, uh, there was a, a survey of who were the threats back in 2006, 2007. And in that survey, the Islamists were first, 
and the militia groups were second, but, thir uh, but the, this organization, the sovereign citizens, were eighth. They were the eighth biggest threat in the uh, country at that time. Now in the 2013-2014 survey, uh, the, um, they are first, the Islamists are second, and the militia, uh, the military groups, the paramilitary, they call themselves patriots groups, are, are now third. So it, there's been a substantial change in the last uh, six or seven years between those two studies on this group. You know, aside from being violent, it also is almost a, a wacky sort of movement because they do, they create their own, own driver's license. They declare right. that their homes are independent, uh, sovereign territory, and you cannot trespass on them. They, they make their own license plates in some instances. And, you know, if, if they weren't so violent and dangerous, it would be comical, but they are a very real threat. And, and, and so is, are, are these law enforcement agencies really, are they doing anything? Has there been any action taken to crack down on them at all? Well, fortunately, they ha there, there's been activity. Uh, after the 2004 911 uh, commission report, uh, realized that only the FBI was engaged in counterterrorism. So they set about the goal from that commission report was to enhance intelligence efforts and information sharing and to bring law enforcement agencies from the state, local, and tribal uh, agencies into the terrorist fight, into anti-terrorism. Uh, they're using the state, local, and tribal uh, as for criminal intelligence and to coordinate intelligence and to, for information sharing. And uh, the federal, the feds, who like to think they're in charge of everything, have actually accepted and actually appreciate the help that they're getting from the uh, SLT group. Their new role now, state, local, and tribal law enforcement, is to be sources of information, uh, to track down leads and handle individual cases, but to provide local intelligence because on individuals and groups, uh, and they, they organize uh, information uh, locally because terrorism, look at, look at Boston Marathon, terrorism is a local event. And a lot of our infrastructures, a lot of our high value targets are located in very rural, less populated local areas. And the, the state, local, and, and uh, uh, agencies uh, have their finger on the pulse of what's going on in their own individual communities. So they're, they're being used uh, very, very much to establish who are the good guys and who are the bad guys today. And one of the other changes that, that's come out of all this analysis is that while the uh, sovereign citizens, the Islamic extremists and the militia and, and patriot groups are still today the top three groups, uh, the left-wing rev revolutionaries have also increased and the extreme anti-abortion groups have also increased. But there's very strong decreased threat from the KKK, from the Christian identity groups, from the neo-Nazis, you don't hear much about them anymore, from the racist skinheads, from the environmental extremists and from animal rights extremists. So across the board at groups as a whole, there's a considerable decrease in the activities uh, and the effectiveness, if you will, of, of extreme organizations. But at the same time, those three are, have really emerged to the top and they're, they're bringing about radical change. Well, Howard, thank you very much for uh, being here with us today, explaining this study, and uh, we always appreciate your work. Thank you, Farron, my pleasure. Republican leadership recently got together to try to find out why they're having such a hard time courting female voters. They honestly don't understand that you can't talk down to an entire demographic without feeling some sort of repercussion from that. So we're going to help them out and explain to them why women are disgusted by the GOP. And I have author Nancy Cohen with me to help the GOP with their problems. Nancy, recently, uh, Carl Rove's Crossroads GPS, along with the American Action Network, they developed this report that was only supposed to be seen by the Republicans that said, look, we have a very real problem with women 
what do we do, guys? And and they still don't seem to get what their problems are. So, so Nancy, can you kind of walk us through the biggest problems that the Republicans have with women right now? Yeah, poor Karl Rove. He's out there shouting in the wilderness, dudes, guys, I did this before. I got Bush elected on this stealth campaign. Could you please just listen to me and stop talking about all those rapey things, all those, you know, God intended you to get pregnant when you're raped. There was one GOP congressman um, that was reported the other day about how um, he used to be a right-wing radio uh, uh, shock jock, and he called two sitting Democratic senators um, bimbos and tennis shoes. So, you know, not a good idea. So, you know, the problem with the GOP is they're saying what they believe. You know, they really didn't need to commission the study. All they needed to do was listen to your show or read my book, Delirium, and they would have known a few years ago what's wrong. And it's 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 kind of funny because they they sincerely don't get it. They go out there, they say these things, as you point out, they mean them. They mean them from the bottom of their heart. And then they don't understand why it's offensive. I mean, they, they think they're living in, you know, puritanical 1800s where something like that, hey, that might help you get elected. But I mean, we're we're a little more modern now. Yeah. And yeah. They, they haven't evolved at all. Yeah, that, uh, that gray old priesthood doesn't really go over with modern women. You know, and I think the reason that the birth control issue and the Hobby Lobby case uh, resonated so much is women kind of get it. It's a fundamental question of respect and um, autonomy and equality and the fact and about women being able to live our lives as equal citizens and live our private lives without, you know, some politician coming between us and our partners and our doctors to make these very personal decisions. So, you know, as long as they want to do that and American women are listening, they're not going to make any headway. Uh, but what Rove is saying, and this is, I think, something for us to remember, is that the way they, this Christian right, religious fundamentalist, sexual fundamentalist, won so many elections between 1994 and 2004 is that when things went bad, they learned how to run these stealth campaigns and do exactly what Rove is saying in this report. You know, talk about our honest differences about abortion, but move on quickly. You know, talk Talk about, um, you know, if you're going to say that you don't believe that women are, pay, are paid less than men, despite every single credible study, then women aren't going to listen to you, right? But nowhere is anybody saying, change the policies, you know, get with the 20th, 21st century. And, and, and in the report, it does mention, throw in quick little talking points, you know, when you're giving speeches, say, you know, oh, I'm all for equality. You know, little things like that. And it, it, it's almost their solutions are more condescending than the problem itself. <laughs> I mean, they, they really don't think women will notice that they're just being lied to by this, you know, old white Republican guy who, who really sees women more as a, a commodity than as human beings. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they do believe that women, I truly believe that they see women as subordinate to men. You know, sure, women can have their careers if they can also be the primary parent, the primary mother. There's no negotiation in um, the modern Republican family, it doesn't seem like, or at least the ones who are speaking. I think there are a lot of silent Republicans out there who are really sick of what their party has become. So the key issue, you know, we're looking ahead at a big election. We've now entered the the like, final stretch of the election season. And women can really save the day here. And there are a lot of groups like Planned Parenthood Action Fund and Emily's List, uh, the Democratic Congresswomen, the Fair Shot Campaign, that are all out there making the case to women about why it's crucial that they vote now. You know, and because women are paid less and because we do more work around the home, women particularly the middle class and working class women don't have time 
to concentrate on politics all that that much. So I think there's a real um, positive sign this season that the message is really getting out there to the voters who matter. Well, let's let's hope you're right. And let's hope that the Republicans finally figure out that you can't insult an entire, you know, basically half of the American population and expect to make that a sustainable party platform. Nancy Cohen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Farron. Great being here. Nancy Cohen is the author of the book, Delirium, The Politics of Sex in America. When we come back, we'll hear from Pap's recent interview with David DeGraw about the economics of revolution. I'm Farron Cousins, and we'll be right back with more Ring of Fire. We perpetuate a culture of crime all the way from Wall Street right down to the Main Street in our hometowns. It's worse than it has been since FDR took control of the problem and said we can't count on industry taking care of the American labor. They probably have already engaged in some type of criminal cover-up. And the law prohibits the government from even doing anything about it. Catch America's lawyer Mike Papantonio on YouTube at youtube.com slash goleftv. David, uh, new book, The Economics of Revolution. A uh, lot of reasons that might have pushed you to move to this is this is a critically important book, and the research is just overwhelmingly great. Uh, tell me what pushed you here. I mean, why did you say just I got to put this down on paper? Well, you know, Mike, there, there's just an absolute death of journalism in this country. The the economic reporting, the mainstream media, just repeating what amounts to statistical fraud from the U.S. government, uh, it's just staggering. You know, the, glow, the economy, uh, the economic policy in this country is truly a crime against humanity, and the mathematics back it up. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, just a, a quick headline, you know, half of 1% of the 1%'s wealth, that's 0.5% of the 1%'s wealth, could eliminate poverty in this entire country, Mike. Well, how bad, you know, let, let me back up just a little bit. Is it that journalists don't have the training? I mean, you know, I haven't come through journalism school. I, I felt like we had to have a pretty broad training in, in everything, economics, humanities, political science, uh, name it. Uh, we, we, in science, we, we had to understand what was going on in the world. Is it just that, they, that, that, that corporate media is not able to get reporters like that, or they don't want reporters to dig into what's really happening on important, so such critically important issues like this? They don't want them to, obviously, Mike, because, you know, the, the problem is that economic research like this just doesn't really get funded in this country. Um, you know, reporters just repeat, you know, what the government tells them, what those in power tell them, you know, they, they reinforce the corporate worldview narrative. And in economic reporting, you have such a strong bias towards elitism. You know, the, the economists that you hear most often in the mainstream media, you know, they all look at the economy through the prism of a wealthy person who has, you know, a million dollars in the bank. Let's talk about what you found and what people need to read this book if they really want to understand how you know, how critically important this is. The, the economics of revolution, I, I think, lays it out. Uh, I can see a, a second and third book coming out of this because I saw plenty of segues. But you, you talk about the idea of being able to remove poverty uh, in this country. How, bid, how bad is, when you, when you looked at the numbers and did the, the calculation, how bad is poverty in this country? Well, it's much worse than the government reports. You know, the government calculates the poverty rate based on what is truly a fraudulent inflation rate to set the poverty threshold, and they do not properly account for geographically based costs of living. Uh, the way the government calculates the poverty rate was established in the early 60s, and they have not revised that once you know, since then. Well, is that a political move? I mean, in other words, you, oh, absolutely. you got you got Obama in office and you don't you don't want to talk about the fact that since he's been there, the poverty rate has continued to increase at just stellar kind of levels. Yeah, you know, I mean, Mike, 
I think o- Obama has been such a travesty. I mean, if you, when you look at these economic numbers, man, this guy has done nothing at all to alleviate the suffering. Uh, you know, you have 150 million people in this country who cannot afford basic necessities. When you say basic, you're talking about being able to eat, buy food, uh, just be able to live day to day. Right, right. Mike, the the bottom line, if you look at the, just to make a pure mathematical argument that everyone can understand, if you look at the economy, there are presently 106 million full-time workers in the economy. There are 213 million working-age people in this country. That means that 50% of the working age population, it's impossible for them to get a full-time job. Okay, so, so superimpose that uh, 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 on top of what is going on in, 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 the, in the backstory. The backstory is, as you point out, and this is st- staggering numbers, my God, that 80, $82 trillion in the overall wealth of the country and that if you if you were to take the 82 trillion dollars and just spread it out evenly i mean we're you know every, everybody had a part of that it's 700,000 dollars per household but right now the truth that that's the wealth that would move to each household 700 700,000 uh 700,000 dollars to each household but the the true wealth of each household is what about 50 it's only 56k like I mean, there's a lot of layers I want to pull back on that, okay, because it's much worse than those numbers indicate. Okay, um, overall wealth from 2007 to 2013 increased 26%, Mike, and it's at an all-time high, as you just said. Now, the median household over that time frame, while wealth increased 26%, they lost 43% of their wealth. So if current trends continue right now, Mike, within the next decade, 50% of U.S. households will be bankrupt. Okay, and your number is if you look at the total 1%, you actually broke down the 1% and you said, okay, well, it, let, let's break it down. Let's say that, that, that it's, uh, it's uh, the, the half of the 1%, the top 10% of the 1%. If you break down all the 1%, they now control an all-time high of about 40% of the wealth in the country. Did I get that right? Yep, that's correct. It's all-time high. Uh, it's about three percentage points higher than it was in the roaring 20s, Mike. But, and and this, this undercounts the problem because, Mike, there is a, an estimated $12 trillion that is hidden offshore um, and and that is held within the top one percent as well. Okay, so you got twelve to thirteen uh, numbers I've seen is twelve to thirteen trillion dollars that's not moving through the economy at all. In other words, it's being held. Uh, you know, I'm going to give it to my children. I'm going to do something. I'm going to buy stocks and bonds with it. I'm I'm not. It's it's not in the economy at all because we gave it to that that top of the one percent. Is that is that kind of the storyline here? <laughs> Um, well, you're partly correct. There is $13 trillion of the 1% accounted for wealth that is unused, sitting in, in bank deposits hoarded away. Okay? So that, that is 40% of the 1%'s wealth. Has there, ever been a, has there ever been a number like that? I mean, just so no, people can understand what not. this does to the absolutely economy. Absolutely not. Your, your position, We're talking trillions of dollars. Okay, right? your, your position has always been that capitalism requires money at the bottom. You, if you don't give money at the bottom, capitalism fails. And so to, to put this in, let, let's talk about this in terms of but, what— But, Mike, let, let, me, let, me, let me just run with that because— the $13 trillion that we're talking about is accounted for wealth. There's another $12 trillion oh, okay. in unaccounted I for wealth that is you. hidden offshore. So if you break that down, that's $25 trillion that is unused, that is sitting collecting dust offshore in bank deposits. It's insane. How do you get to solve this problem? Because capitalism doesn't work. It, 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 if you don't have money there, there are no jobs. There's no manufacturing jobs. People can't. You, you have to have money to generate money for the population. So what's the solution here? 
You know, Mike, there's there's many different solutions. Uh, you know, to single out one is is you know almost impossible. I, I agree. It has uh, to. But be. let me let me just say this, okay? Back in 1944, FDR proposed an economic bill of rights, and he because he understood with the advancements in technology, the advancement of industrialism, and the increase in wealth creation, he understood that the economy was reaching a point where it could very easily provide basic necessities to the entire population. And he proposed an economic bill of rights to do such a thing. And he said these were numbers. We were, Basically, the Bill of Rights were kind of laid out principles of numbers and concepts we'd never exceed. That was my memory of that. In other words, you say uh, debt, for example, might be let's, – let's move to one of those things. For example, as we become – as the population becomes poorer and poorer, the, in, the increase of debt then magnifies that problem, correct? Oh, absolutely. De- debt is currently at $12 trillion. The, the average person over 18 carries $50,000 in debt right now. And it, it – what – it's just absurd, Mike, because there's so much wealth. There should not be poverty in this country. Where does this head if this debt – okay, if you've got people that, as you point out, and it very – again, I just can't recommend this book enough, The Economics of Revolution. But as I look at it, you, you make this just compelling argument to say – that, A, we're not doing anything to stop this increase in debt. And then I th- my memory is that in that you actually wrote that if we keep increasing at this rate, then something like 50% of the population will be bankrupt on paper. And, and, and in right. reality, is, is this progresses. Is, did I get that right? That's absolutely true because, you know, look, as I said, there's only 106 million full-time jobs in the economy right now, which leaves half the working age population with either a part-time job or no job at all. And the costs of living have been increasing dramatically, uh, you know, between health care costs, the cost of raising children. I mean, costs of living are increasing across the board. Meanwhile, the, the median income has stagnated and declined since 2007, the median income has fallen 8.3%. I mean, literally, instead of an all-time high in overall Which wealth, it should be. Making, which it should. We have an all, Okay, so the point is we have an overall, it just incredibly historic high in wealth. Okay, let's correct. begin there. But it's held by 40% of the population. And what that does is it creates debt for the people who are trying to simply struggle because you've taken out of the out of the money column in capitalism twenty six trillion dollars that are either held offshore, they're being hidden, or they're being hoard, it's being hoarded in the United States. So, so what that ends up doing is is is, is if I follow your your theory here, is is bankruptcy of one form or another is inevitable. It's inevitable unless we change the unless, you, unless we change the metrics here. In the current economy, on the current government policy, 70% of the U.S. population is on a fast track to poverty. Okay. You also point out in there that um, – I thought this is a staggering number, but you backed it up so well. It shows that the average family needs an income of about twice – the level that it's getting right now, the average typical family needs about twice it just to cover basic expenses. Is, is, is that correct? Yeah, Mike. I mean, if you, again, this comes into what I, is, I'm calling it statistical fraud by the government, but I mean, I, I lay it all out in detail. And how do you, 10,000 feet of statistical fraud, just give me an idea of what's, what's going on by the government and why it's going on. Well, first of all, they peg inflation at a 2% annual rate, if you measure it the way inflation was measured in 1980 before they started playing games with the measurement, it is at 10%. And, you know, as I said earlier, since 2007, median wages have declined 8.3%. Meanwhile, the average household has lost 43% of their wealth. And that highlights how much the cost of living is actually rising. For an individual, you need to make 35k a year 
to uh, keep up with the cost of basic necessities. If you look at the actual spending habits of the average worker, you actually need 42k to act, you know, break even. 42,000. Okay, right. so and, so and, so you look at the nightly news and you've got these reports that tell you, uh, gee whiz, jobs are coming back, the economy's making a rebound. Oh boy! Yeah. Basically, that is just absolute fantasy, crazy talk. If I if I right. if the and, numbers that and these look, let me point something out. I think it's very important. What you did in the book that I think is 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 really elegant is these aren't your numbers. This, this these are numbers that come from the Federal Reserve. They come from the GOA. They come right. from they it's come, the government's own numbers. Right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so the unemployment rate that's again statistical fraud because if you take the the June jobs report, right, it was trumpeted in the media as you know something like three hundred thousand new jobs added to the economy. How great it is. Meanwhile. 523,000 full-time jobs were eliminated from the economy, and 800,000 part-time jobs were added. So part-time jobs are being added, and very low-paying full-time jobs are being added, and well-paying jobs are being eliminated. I mean, we have 7.5 million part-time, for economic reason, people who've had full-time jobs. Do, do you know, David, you know what's something really amazing about what you've written here? And I don't, I don't guess you sat down with Tom Hartman, but you and Tom Hartman came to the same conclusion different ways. He, he, Hartman finished a book called The Crash of 2016. Right. And if I look at some of the methodology he used to show why it's happening, you get to the same place for another reason. Look, I, we're out of time, but i got to tell you, this is a great book. Uh, I want to talk to you about it again. I urge you to continue writing about this, and maybe it can break through to the idiots in, uh, in, in corporate media. David DeGraw, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Mike. Really appreciate all the great work you're doing. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com, on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio, and on Facebook. I'm Farron Cousins, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.